Are the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord the same? Part 2 As in previous presentations, I remind the listener that this presentation does not represent a personal attack on the character of Michael Nassim, but on the character of his arguments and the assertions that he is making about eschatological events. In part one, we looked at the problematic nature of Michael's assertions that the day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation are identical. We saw that his critique of pre-wrath was woefully inaccurate, that it misrepresented pre-wrath fundamentals, and contained not even one reference to or citation from authoritative pre-wrath source material. We also observed a disturbing absence of interaction with the relevant biblical texts in context, especially those containing the explicit statements on which pre-wrath tenets are based. Many of his arguments relied upon presuppositions which he never verified from the biblical text, but simply assumed to be true. Basic questions were never asked. We then looked at how Jesus explicitly defines the Great Tribulation, not as a general time of trouble against the world as a whole, but rather an unprecedented global persecution initiated by the Antichrist against faithful saints and Israel. We also observed in Matthew 24 verses 36 to 44 and Luke 17, 22 to 30, that the terms parousia and revealing, when applied to the return of Christ, are co-referential. That is, they refer to the same event, and we also saw how these passages connect with Paul's description of Christ's parousia in Second Thessalonians, which explicitly confirms the back-to-back, same-day sequence of rescue and wrath depicted by Jesus. In this second part, then, we look at some passages which further highlight the distinction between the Day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation. The different timing of the Day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation. The Scriptures tell us explicitly when the beginning of both the Day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation occur in the sequence of end-time events and they most certainly do not commence or conclude at the same point. In Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22, we read the following. So, says Jesus, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no flesh would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Jesus informs believers that as soon as they see the abomination of desolation occur, they are to flee immediately. However, they are not told to flee before that. Daniel 9 verse 27 tells us explicitly that Antichrist's breach of covenant and erecting of the abomination occurs at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Thus we read, And he shall make a strong covenant with many, or it could also read, And he shall strengthen the covenant with many, for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. End quote. Thus, we know with 100% certainty the specific point in the sequence of Ed time events when the great tribulation or persecution begins. When, though, does it end? We do not know the exact day or the hour, but we do know what signifies its conclusion. From Matthew 24 we read again, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming 
or the parousia of the Son of Man. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The great tribulation then closes, when the cosmological phenomena that herald the commencement of the parousia appear in the sky. We are told that these phenomena occur immediately after the tribulation of those days. The abomination of desolation and the cosmological signs given by Jesus mark both the beginning and the end of the Great Tribulation, respectively. As a side note, many pre-trib propagators, Michael Nassim among them, claim that the cosmic signs and Jesus' appearing in the clouds mark the end of the 70th week of Daniel. It says, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is, of course, the glorious second coming of Christ, right at the end of the 70th week. However, if the parousia occurred at the very end of the 70th week of Daniel, it would be entirely possible to calculate when it occurs, something which flatly contradicts the explicit teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 36, that no man knows the day or the hour of his parousia. We must therefore reject such an assertion as false teaching. The Beginning of the Day of the Lord The scriptures explicitly tell us that the Day of the Lord, God's eschatological judgment and vengeance program against a God-hating, Christ-rejecting and saint-slaughtering world, will be preceded by a certain set of highly perceivable cosmological phenomena, and these signs are given as explicit precursors to the day of the Lord in the book of the prophet Joel. In Joel chapter 2 verse 30 to 32 we read the following, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that every one who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. We also read in Joel chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion, and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. We see a similar pattern to this in Isaiah. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Isaiah 13 verses 9 to 13. Joel is very specific that these signs appear before the day of the Lord's wrath and vengeance commences. They are ordained by God to herald its arrival. Consequently, they appear in the same judgment precursor role in other places as well. The fifth seal in Revelation chapter 6 tells us explicitly that God's eschatological judgment and vengeance program 
had not yet begun at that point. When the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who live on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants and brethren, who were to be killed as they were, would be completed. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. However, after this, the sixth seal depicts the same phenomena related by Joel, heralding the inception of the day of wrath of God and of the Lamb. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and every one, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The Lord Jesus himself teaches us, that these very same signs mentioned by Joel and Isaiah precede his parousia. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Matthew twenty four twenty nine to 31 Mark thirteen twenty four to 27 Luke twenty one twenty five to 27 in all three of these cases, Joel, Revelation, and the Olivet Discourse, the cosmological phenomena are explicitly stated to occur at the same point in the eschatological timetable, that is, immediately before the eschatological judgment event commences. This confirms that despite some variation in wording and description, these passages all refer to the self-same set of signs. It hardly needs to be said that as these cosmological phenomena occur immediately after the Great Tribulation and before the beginning of the Day of the Lord, then Michael Nisim's assertion that the two are synonymous is utterly false. The same phenomena that signify the closing of the Great Tribulation also usher in the day of the Lord. This is exactly in harmony with the back-to-back -back same day pattern revealed by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, which we discussed in part one. If you are also thinking, but Jesus doesn't mention the day of the Lord in the Olivet Discourse, but only his parousia being preceded by the signs, does this mean then that? Well, yes, it does the parousia of Christ and the day of the Lord are co-referential terms. And one clear example of this is where Paul, referring back to the material in chapter 1 of Second Thessalonians, writes, Now, concerning the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 2. And this brings us then to our next difference between the day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation. Events in Second Thessalonians that must precede the day of the Lord. Second Thessalonians provides us with a laundry list of highly visible and discernible events that must happen before the day of the Lord begins. Let's just recap. A great apostasy or departure from the faith, 
accompanied by the revelation of the lawless one, also known as the Antichrist, declaring himself to be the supreme God and enthroning himself in the temple. This event is also referred to as the abomination of desolation. This revealing is accompanied by a tidal wave of satanic deception and demonic signs and wonders. Logically, it is only after his self-deification that Antichrist will demand the worship of the world. Therefore, the midpoint of the 70th week also marks the point where the restrainer is removed. As Revelation chapters 12 and 13 tell us, it is only at that, that time that authority is given to the beast and the false prophet to reign and act and to perform the aforementioned deceiving signs and wonders and make war on the saints. It is not given to them before that point, that is, the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. Some pre-tribulationists, including Michael Nassim, try to claim that Antichrist's enthronement in the temple can occur during the day of the Lord and not before. This Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation in the midpoint of the 70th week. This is how we know who the man of sin, the son of perdition, is. So all that this text is saying is that the man of sin will be revealed before the day of the Lord comes, and the man of sin is identified as he that will sit in the temple of God. But the sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord. This is just an identifier of who Paul is speaking about. They try to interpret Antichrist's revealing as merely being his identification by the church and thus endeavor to disassociate it from his sitting in the temple and self-deification. This is rather nonsensical as it willfully ignores that the revealing is also mentioned in verse 8 as being associated with the removal of the restrainer, which has to happen at the midpoint, as it is the very precondition that enables the defiling of the temple, the self-deification of Antichrist accompanied by lying signs and wonders, in the first place. Therefore, the day of the Lord cannot begin before at least the, big, the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. This brings us to another thing referred to in 2 Thessalonians that must also occur before the day of the Lord, and it is connected with the reasons that the ungodly are condemned when Christ is revealed as described in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-10. The ungodly are judged and punished because they are disobedient and thus are deceived to worship Antichrist, and secondly, because they persecute the saints. Before the day of the Lord, then, those who reject the truth must first be deceived by Antichrist when he demands the worship of the world. God will condemn those who have no love for the truth and reject the gospel, but prior to that, as a consequence of their disobedience, he delivers them over to Antichrist's deception in order to seal their doom, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming, or parousia literally, of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In context, the phrase, what is false, in Greek, the lie, is clearly a reference to Antichrist's blasphemous claims to absolute deity. Those who reject the true God and the true word will be given over to the deception of the false God and his counterfeit word. They will follow Antichrist and worship him and take his mark, thus condemning themselves. Revelation 14, 9-11
one effect of the deception on the disobedient will be their implacable hatred and persecution of the saints during the Great Tribulation. For those who believe Antichrist is the one and only supreme God, anyone not of that persuasion will be considered an idolater and executed. This too must happen before the day of the Lord, because the quote, earth dwellers, unquote, as Revelation refers to them, are specifically judged because of this slaughter when the great day of God's wrath begins, Revelation 6, 9-17. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we read from Paul the following. We ourselves boast about you in the churches of God, writes Paul, for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since, indeed, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The great end-time persecution by the ungodly is foreshadowed in the experience of the Thessalonians at the hands of their fellow countrymen. From Paul's perspective, it was a real possibility that Jesus could have returned in his generation. Thus, in his letter, he includes himself as one of those who would experience relief from tribulation if that indeed occurred. The Greek reveals, though, another contrast between the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord. Behind the word affliction, which appears four times, Paul uses the noun thlipsis and the verb from the same root to emphasize that when the Lord returns, the tables will be turned. The persecuted saints will be relieved from their tribulation, and God will begin dishing out to their persecutors some tribulation of their own, as he begins his program of vengeance and judgment. Who is giving out the thlipsis, then, and who is receiving it, are another difference between the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord. The Ghastly Gap Theory What, though, does the back-to-back -back nature of rapture and wrath which Michael Nassim is so adamantly opposed to have to do with this issue, and how does that fit into all this? The statements of Jesus in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 38, and Luke 17, 26 to 30, strike at the very heart of pre-trib theory, namely the doctrine of imminence. That idea that Jesus can rapture the church at any moment, and no prophesied events need to happen before that. This concept, however, has a terrible weakness. For if the day of the Lord must be preceded by certain prophesied events and signs, yet it immediately follows the rapture on the same day, in fact, then those prophesied events that precede the day of the Lord must necessarily precede the rapture as well. These words of Jesus taken at face value utterly destroy the doctrine of imminence, revealing its manifestly unbiblical nature. For some time now, pre-trib leaders have been desperately scrabbling for a way to circumnavigate this obvious difficulty. One effort has been dubbed the Gap Theory by pre-Roth scholars because it posits a gap between the rapture and the day of the Lord, thus allowing time for the prophesied events that precede the day of the Lord to occur. The face value meaning of Jesus' words precludes such an interpretation, of course, so pre-tribs have sought ways to evade this by chipping away at the very words of Jesus himself. Here is one example by pre-trib teacher Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his critique of pre-Roth scholar Marvin Rosenthal. Fruchtenbaum writes, The analogy Ro Rosenthal uses is that of Noah and Lot. In the day that Lot left Sodom, the city was destroyed, 
and in the day that Noah entered into the ark, the flood came. Rosenthal states, Noah entered the ark, then the judgment began on the same day. The statement is correct for Lot, and the text does teach that Sodom was destroyed in the same day Lot left Sodom. But this statement is not true in reference to Noah. Luke 17 verse 27 simply states that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. There is nothing that Jesus said that implies that the judgment came on the same day that Noah entered the ark. In fact, Genesis 7 verse 10 states that the waters of the flood began seven days after Noah entered the ark and then continued forty days. The flood did not come the same day that Noah entered the ark, nor was all flesh destroyed in that day. And this quote is from When the Trumpet Sounds, page 392. Though I have been aware of some of Fruchtenbaum's thoughts on Noah, I only became aware of this statement a few months ago via Eschatos Ministries Biblical Prophecy Programme number 39, and I was utterly shocked when I heard it. Let's see now if Arnold's claim stacks up with the biblical text. This is Luke chapter 17 verses 26 to 27 from the English Standard Version. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Clearly these words are missing in the ASV or the Arnold Standard Version edition of Luke 17 verse 27. Now let's look at the Genesis account of this event. In Genesis 7, 11 to 13, we read the following. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. Genesis seven eleven to 13 Arnold Fruchtenbaum appears not to have read as far as verse 13. What I find particularly bizarre about this, he has authored an entire commentary on Genesis and yet somehow managed to miss this. His claims not only grievously mutilate the biblical text, as those phrases which contradict his gap theory are excised from the text, but the false assertion that the statement, same day rescue in wrath, is not true in reference to Noah, rather implies that the word of God incarnate did not actually know what he was talking about when he used the Noah and flood analogy. The implications of that are very disturbing because it impinges on the veracity and inerrancy of Scripture, and certainly leaves the impression that some pre-tribs would rather sacrifice those things than their pet doctrine. Concluding Remarks In this response to Michael Nassim's article, I think that I have sufficiently demonstrated that the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord cannot be one and the same. The poor quality of Michael's article, however, is not what should concern us the most. It is the context in which the article was produced that really should worry us. Lower-level figures in the pre-trib camp largely parrot what they hear from the figures higher up the food chain, like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and the current pre-trib flavour of the month, Lee Brainard. It's not wrong to learn from Bible teachers, not at all. But we should never accept everything they say uncritically. Even apart, for example, from some of his other teachings, Lee Brainard's treatment of early church material is truly appalling. Arnold Fruchtenbaum's selective quotation from Luke 17 verse 27 and his misreading of the Noah account is deeply disturbing. All these things greatly concern me 
because in the context of the overall pattern of pre-trib behaviour, it is becoming increasingly difficult to accept that these kinds of occurrences are unintentional oversights. When error has progressed to a point where people have stopped listening to the truth and misrepresent or attempt to silence scriptural reproof, that is bad enough. But when they start editing early church documents and even the biblical text itself in order to remove objections, and yet no rebuke is heard coming from within the pre-trib senior leadership, are we seeing a chilling sign that God's patience is becoming exhausted and that the pre-trib movement is being given over to its error? I think we are. Thank you.